Episode 239 of CBP Cast with guest UC Pakanen, recorded March 18th, 2020. Sponsor of this episode of CPP Cast is the PVS Studio team. The team promotes regular usage of static code analysis and the PVS Studio static analysis tool. In this episode, we discuss Corona's effect on the C community. Then we talk to UC Pakanen. UC gives us some updates on Mison Build and the Mison Manual. Welcome to episode 239 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? No, I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing okay. Um, I, I don't want to like go over Corona stuff like every week for the next two months, however long we're going to be oh, in this. Yeah. But uh, I, I feel like we should you know, mention it briefly because uh, it's kind of really starting to pick up here in the U.S. at least. It's starting to become a, a concern. Well, at the very least, while well, we have this in the news items later, we're going to try to yeah. keep everyone apprised of anything that is affecting the C++ community. Sure. But uh, you have any, you know, news yourself on, on that end? Are you okay? Family keeping safe? Everything's fine here. I just thought it was interesting. So I thought I would just mention this. Um, my sister, uh, the school district that my sister has her kids in, Mm-hmm. is one that like about five years ago was set up in a pilot program to do uh, online school when they needed to. Oh, so, so they're fully prepared been, for right now. They're fully prepared for it. That's been a normal part of their lives. If there was going to be a snow day or a bad weather day for some reason, they just flip the switch and everyone does school remote. They d- literally never miss school uh, for a disaster or whatever. And it comes up, you know, they, where they live, they've got a few snow days a year or whatever, but they just do it remotely. So uh, it's to the point that, like, if you're someone who can't afford internet access or a computer, they have Chromebooks that they issue to all the students. They've wow. got um, Wi-Fi cellular hotspots that they issue to the kids who don't have Wi-Fi at home. And school just keeps going. So to them, no big deal. That's great. Uh, I, I will say my... Uh, county here in North Carolina was a little delayed on deciding to cancel. They kind of, they waited until I think Saturday or Sunday afternoon before they officially called it. Um, oh, we were yeah, prepared that's a to, week after a lot of other areas. Yeah. 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 And, and several other counties in, in the state had already called it by then. They were definitely one of the last ones to go, but we were already prepared to keep the kids home just, you know, to play it safe. So I'm, I'm glad they finally did make the right call and they're still trying to figure out things like how they're going to teach the kids online because they're definitely not set up for that currently. Yeah, I think they're probably, my sister's school district is, I, I would say, likely very unique, definitely in the U.S., maybe in the world. I don't um, know that they're so fully set up for it. Hopefully after this, uh, more schools follow suit with that type of program. Right. Okay, well, at top there, sort of like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we did get this tweet from Victor Bogato saying, CPP cast, quick question about uh, the episode we had recently with Barry Revson. I didn't catch it correctly. The generalized pack expansion, is that on C20 or on track for C23? That's and I believe. For 23. Yeah, that's a proposal for 23. We talked about a few things with Barry. He, he worked on a bunch of changes to improve. Um, the spaceship operator, and those all made it into C plus plus twenty. And we also talked about some you know proposals he has, including uh, the pack declarations. And what was the other thing we talked a lot about? Um, there was one other thing I think that is coming for twenty three. Oh, the pipeline. We talked about the pipeline stuff. Is what? He's oh, okay. On. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, you know reaching out with the tweet. Uh, we always like to hear your thoughts about the show. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. 
And joining us today is UC Pakkanen. UC is the original creator and project lead of the Misan build system. This has led to many interesting things, such as people coming up to him at conferences to compete in who has the most terrible build system set up inside their corporate walls. His prior work experience has ranged from desktop Linux to mail sorting, mobile development, slot machines, and computer security. His hobbies at the time of writing include sitting at home, waiting for the coronavirus lockdown procedures to end. UC, welcome to the show. Or welcome back to the Hi. show, I should say. Well, it's, it's good to be back. Uh, maybe for some context, uh, since you listed your hobby as waiting for coronavirus to pass, where do you live? So I live in Finland. Okay. Um, and they closed the schools here, I think, today. So like, yesterday oh. was the last day when the kids mm. were allowed to be at school. But um, other other things like this, and there are no meetings of more than 10 people and so on. Yep. Um but but I think that's pretty good. So uh, today I went to the to the nearest mall to buy up some supplies, which is included a PlayStation Four, <laughs> uh, and and there was it was actually quite nice because there was no rush. There were not that many people. You can get to the stores, and everything was was pretty good. All that's things good. considered, right? So no concerns for you at the moment. You're just gonna play a bunch of games until things pass over. Well, um, so I used to work remote, uh, like 100% remote for a few years. And, and this is very much reminiscent of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so there haven't been like, like panic purchases of people, people emptying the stores or, or any of that you, you might hear on the news. Um, uh, so for the moment, things are working pretty well. Good. So that's, that's good. good. Yeah, we'll say overall as an industry, we're we're very lucky in that most of us are already pretty well equipped in, to work from home. You know, right? A lot of us, you know, might either work from home already, or we can just grab a laptop and, and take it home. So that's good. Yeah, ten ourselves. years for me now. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the, my current. Uh, so I'm a consultant. So my current customer has had uh, a thing for many years that consultants are not allowed to work remote. And this is a decision made by someone some time ago, and like you cannot watch from this. And suddenly, when this thing happens, it's like okay, so you just wrote the notes. <laughs> I mean, we changed our mind. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. <laughs> and and, and I, so this is the second day that I'm doing this now. And and I remember the like the best part of working remotely is that you get two extra hours a day because you don't need to travel. No commute. So yeah. that, that's that's really nice. Yeah, when you just have to walk down the stairs for your commute or whatever, that's nice. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, you see, uh, we got a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more about Mison and the, the Mison manual that you worked on, okay? Right. Sounds good. Okay, so I, I promise this will be the last mention of Corona for this episode. Uh, oh, as Jason mentioned, we, we have this list of C++ events that were affected by the coronavirus Um that Bryce Lalbach posted on Reddit. And yeah, uh, lots and lots of conferences have postponed or just canceled their conference completely. Um, I think we were talking last week about whether or not C++ Now was going to uh, make a change, and they did decide to cancel that conference, yeah, which was going to be in uh, in May. Um, and yeah, lots of others. Uh, Cute Day, Conan Days, ACCU, C++ Russia, um, so CPPP. far, it's CPPP. CPPP, yeah. So far, it looks like pretty much every conference that was taking place over the next like two or three months has uh, has decided to postpone or cancel. Hopefully, the I ones the one... for like the fall will be unaffected. Uh, so C plus plus on C, uh, mm-hmm. Phil Nash's conference, yeah. um, is still scheduled for June seventh through the tenth. And if you that go to the website, just under three months away, right? And Phil has listed it as. Uh, tickets are currently um, ticket sales are currently paused. Okay, so he's making so he's made no probably. changes, yeah. but he's being um, cautious, I guess, at the moment. That makes sense. Now, I made a comment on Twitter, and I will stand by it. <laughs> I think um, all of these conferences that are doing one hundred percent refunds. Mm-hmm. I know that these conferences, and we've had many of them on here, they run on very tight budgets. They're not big profit-making things, necessarily. Uh, so I suggested that if the conference needs to get canceled, I personally think it's okay for them to keep 5% of the ticket price or something so that it doesn't bankrupt the conference, if, if that would make any difference at all. Maybe it wouldn't make a difference. Maybe it's too little money. I don't know. I, I would hope that... Um... 
you know, the venues or whatever other costs that they would accrue would be able to uh, work with them and they'd be able to get that money back. So hopefully they're not out much I've, money, if, if any at all. And that part, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, for people who already started printing all their supplies and everything, it could be a significant amount of money. Could be. Uh, the, but, the other thing yeah. I wanted to mention, though, is we, we talked about the conferences, but there is a 2020 ISO meeting that has decided oh, yes. to cancel. Uh, the one in Varna, which was going to be uh, in June, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if they'll look into doing like a remote meeting or something. Like right now, they're, they're just saying canceled. But uh, I mean, is that going to possibly like delay the next standard or, or just mean less goes into it? The official word is that it will not delay C plus plus twenty three. Okay, that has been stated. Um, I can't give you a link at the moment, but yeah. that would be the yeah. Um, it might mean less goes in. Okay. You see, you have any uh, thoughts on this? Were there any uh, conferences you were planning to speak at that were postponed or canceled? Um, so there was going to be a, a, a build uh, track that organized, I think, by the Basel people in New York uh, mm -hmm. in May. And I submitted a talk to that, but then they they canceled that. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe sometimes later. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there would, should be something like a, like an online conference. Um some like something like that so so like have have something where you have people talking and you know, all the talks that aren't aren't being held at conferences could now be an online maybe and that's that's a really good point um yeah. something we don't have any news items about on here but if you're following uh things on twitter and on reddit you will see that a lot of uh users groups are doing things like coffee get togethers or uh drinking via skype or whatever hanging out and chatting and a lot of meetups are going fully online as well at the moment. So there are things to keep your eye open for. Yeah. One thing just on that note, I saw that uh, Discord, which is a you know chat tool that has a good video uh, service built into it. I think they had uh, previous limits of only like 10 people for a video conference. If you were just using the free membership, I believe they increased that to 50. So oh, okay. if you want to have a, a big conference with a bunch of friends or coworkers, you could do that on Discord. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is ASM DOM, and this is a library on GitHub to build a minimal WebAssembly virtual DOM for a C++ single page application. And uh, definitely not something uh, I've used before. I don't really do much web development, but I thought this looked interesting. Part of it yeah. broke my brain. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you all look at the examples for this? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you, I, I've done some um, some work from this, and and the big problem is getting to and from the browser because mm, okay. the, the actual interface between WebAssembly and and the, the browser is just integers, if I remember correctly, possibly yeah. strings, and 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 you have to build everything up from atoms. And and if you look at like the, the examples, it's basically it's kind of like JavaScript written in a C plus plus way. So you have when this is clicked, you have lambda, and then things happen. Mm -hmm. And and the thing that I think this is going to be really convenient for is that if you want to create a, an application that has a control interface, which is a website, so you just have a web server and you connect to it and you can do things. And with this or these sorts of technologies, you can do a fairly good. Uh, thing where you have your website is web page is the control interface so it's kind of like a GUI thing, toolkit for for like very simple uses yeah and the examples i mean from base like what you said uh it's difficult to describe but it really does look like javascript integration they've got like div tags with an on click yeah. attribute and then a c plus plus lambda in there and that's the part that made me go okay that's weird <laughs> Yeah. It also made me go, I want that because I'm currently working on a project that could have used exactly this. <laughs> ah, well, Are you going to try it out? Yeah. Um, probably not at work. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe for fun. Right. Okay. Well, it says that you needs, uh, it uses GCCX to do this, and I don't know what that means. I don't... Oh, there we go. Okay. So it has some other pro processing project or something that lets it do that. Oh, Yeah. What, okay, what is yeah, GCCX? It's a transformation tool. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is an article on the Coding Tidbit blog, and this is the a review of a tool called Deleaker, which I have not heard of before, but it's a Windows-based um, 
memory profiler. It's supposed to be very good at uh, detecting memory leaks. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like it has pretty good support for both C++ and C Sharp and, and, and mixed applications that have both you know C Sharp and C++ together. So it seems pretty powerful. And you don't need to um, you know rebuild with any specific tooling or anything. It just hooks into your uh, hooks into a debug build okay. without any changes. Can you say something else, Jason? I was just going to comment that it's Windows only at the moment. Yeah, it does look like it's Windows only. But um, if you are on an, a Windows platform or if you're on a cross platform, it looks like it's a pretty good tool. You've done this kind of thing before, right, Rob? With C Sharp and C++ in the same project? Yeah, I do. And, and that's what my primary uh, job for work is, working on a mixed C Sharp and C++ application. So I might look into this myself. How often is it that, like, say reference counted or garbage collected C sharp objects somehow uh, cause a problem in C plus plus land because something is destroyed when you didn't expect it to be or vice versa. I don't run into that very often because I think we keep a pretty thin layer and try not to like pass C sharp objects down into the C plus plus land, but okay. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this one? You see, um, I don't really do windows development. Okay. So, so I don't, but, but more tools are better. It's better. More yeah. tools are always better. More tools are always better. Use all the tools that you have for finding bugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we did have you on the show, but it was uh, 201 episodes ago when we first had you on to talk about <laughs> Mison Build. And this might be a loaded question, but do you want to maybe start off by telling us how, what's changed in Mison Build since we last had you on like four years ago? Okay, so the biggest difference between now and four years ago is that uh, we have actual users, <laughs> and, and actually quite a lot of them, and, and fairly fairly large projects. Um, so some of them include uh, stuff like Mesa, which is the 3D graphics stack on Linux. Oh, wow. So oh, if you're okay. watching this uh, or listening this on a, on a PC that runs Linux and you see graphics on the screen, it's probably uh, built with Mesa, the entire graphics stack, so the OpenGL stack and the Vulkan stack and, and all the all those things, and all the uh, user space parts of the drivers. And and there are a bunch of other things, so it's the GStreamer, which is the it's a big multimedia framework. And and I know that there is a, that a commercial application that's being sold that's a mix of C and C Sharp, so mm -hmm. exactly this, which is using GStreamer for, I think it was a video conferencing application. And, and there's... there's uh, Bunch of other things like the the corn shell, which is one of the original shells from uh, Plan Nine or even earlier, and and it, it, this has the record of being the the biggest in, like build time boost ever, because when they switched from their make based thing to Mesen, it got thirty five times faster, thirty five percent, thirty five times. Uh, where did that come from? Um, so they explained it to me that they had some sort of. Um, uh, software development platform thing that was that was came from Plan Nine, okay. uh, which was developed in the eighties and was make and magical things, <laughs> and no one no one can understand what it was, and and then they just threw it all away and and built it from scratch, and and then and this is the thing has has actually happened to me several times is that when people convert their old projects into Mesen and then they compile them. They don't believe that it actually compiled because it's so fast. Oh wow! So this, uh, so there's lots of easy gains to be had if you have one of those very old uh, make-based things. Um, and like one thing which I found out was just like last week is that there is an, an uh, project called Open Titan, which is a kind of like a root of trust for processors. So it's it's um, I read the, the the website, but it's kind of what they do is that they have a a special chip that, that verifies the boot ROM for CPUs, and they want to have a full tool chain where you have know everything from from beginning to the end, so you can trust your silicon. Okay. It's based on the on the Google's uh, Titan chips that they have, and and this is built with with Mesen, and they combine that with with building building the Verilog, and and all this, and which is which is kind of cool, and 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 so on. And there's a Picolibc, which is C library. Uh, used uh, created by Keith Packard, and, and and he's building it for for his risk work on Risk Five. So there are like twenty eight different versions of Risk Five if you count all the combinations of things that you can have in your processor. 
and he builds uh, all 28 versions of the C library and runs all the tests with them on, on QMU. Wow. In a, in, a, in a single ninja invocation. I said, like, and he showed it to me earlier this year. It's like, this is actually kind of cool. And, and, and then there are commercial projects and, and there, there is a company that uses it to create firmware for lasers. Hmm. Um, I am not aware of anyone using it with sharks, but if someone out there knows, let me know because I want to have <laughs> both sharks and lasers. Um, that was a good combo. Yes. Um, so that's, that's the biggest change. So the core of Meson hasn't really changed. Um, uh, you, you write your build definition and so on, but it's, it's, it's mostly been polish and, and the polishing always takes 10 X the amount of time to create the actual core. Right. And that's basically what we've been doing. I uh, recently uh, had to build a project that was autoconf based and it had been so long since I had done that. And I had forgotten how it had to, you know, it does the detection of all the features and then again, and then again, and then again for each sub project. Um, and yeah, I just thought about that when you're talking about this 20 times performance boost in building and how people don't believe it compiled. I, I think I can see that if they're moving from autoconf and make and such. Yeah. Yeah. And this, so this is particularly bad if you are on Windows because configure scripts on Windows run even slower than they do on, on Linux. So, so GStreamer had a thing where they had a, a full build of their thing, like a daily build. And on Linux, it took about an hour. And, and compiling it on Windows took more than a day. So you wow. could have a daily build because it took more than a day to build. And that's and then basically... They that. It's about an hour now as well. And that was Configure's problem, effectively. Mostly, yes. Yeah. And there's uh, this special thing for get text because it compiles itself several times and then does something weird. I don't know, but it's very slow. Right. Get Yeah. I feel like I'm so glad that I've moved beyond most of those old build tools now all right <clears throat> okay so uh in january you just released uh the Mison manual as an ebook uh do you want to tell us a little bit about that and, and what motivated you to write an ebook okay so so let's start with something like special for all the ucp pcast listeners so so the mes- manual is available for purchase at meson-manual.com Okay. Uh, but for one week on, uh, after this this podcast goes out, you can use the special code CPPcast2020, and that gives you ten euros off the price. Mm. So so it's uh, until the Friday of next week. Is that like and all so, uppercase CPPcast2020? Any spaces? No, no, it's just uh, lowercase and okay. all, all together, no dashes. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So the 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 main motivation why I wrote it was was pretty much the same motivation I had for writing Mison in the first place, which is that I felt like doing it, um, uh, which is usually a good way, like, to reason to do anything. Sure. Um, and then the, there was an, like a, a different goal, which came in later, is that uh, there's been a lot of talk about how to to compensate people who are developing open source and maintaining open source projects for their work. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, just sending money from one country to another for no reason is difficult, and, th- and there are tax problems, and, and it gets very difficult. Uh, but then, like, um, th- if you sell an actual product, that's like there's established conventions on how to do that. And then, like, okay, so here's a it's a uh, ebook that you can buy, and 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 it's like it's very easy if you want to get your company to buy it. There's there's people know how to do that. And it's it's very simple, and 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 all the money problems and and things, it's it's these are solved problems. So so as an exam, as an experiment, like could this work? Could this be a way for for people to to contribute um, to the maintenance of of free software projects? It, it was an experiment. Let's see, see mm-hmm. how it goes. Uh, so how long has the book been for sale now? So it was published at LinuxConf Australia, which was in January. Okay. Uh, so about two months. Uh, and in this time, it has sold about sixty copies, I think. Okay. So not not massively. Old. So the big problem with selling anything is is marketing and exposure. It's like how do you even get people to know that this is a thing that you can buy? And and um, advertising is always difficult. So like how how to get get the message out there, so to say. Right. Okay. Well, listeners, yeah, if you're interested in, in using Mesa and want to support the project, you should definitely check out that link and. Uh share it around 
Um, so what do you hope uh, users of Mison will get out of the manual that they can't find in like any existing documentation you might have had? So the existing documentation that we have um, is, is kind of heavily... It's, it's wiki-like, let's say. Mm-hmm. So um, you, there are pages on things, and then you read them and you understand. And then there's like copies of like, if you want to know how to, how to use this in, a, in like an actual project, look at this unit test in in Messenger's test directory because there's a sample project that does that. Right. So, but the book uh, itself is actually it's it's written and edited like a book. So there's an actual n- narrative um, and there's background information on how how compilation works and how cross compilation works and what are all the different terms that go there and and maybe it, like um, I sent you a copy of that. So if if any of you either of you has have read it, maybe you can comment on whether whether that's actually been successful. <laughs> I didn't have a chance to read through the whole thing, unfortunately. <laughs> well, <laughs> like part, parts of it. Yeah, yeah, but there, there are things like: um, Have you ever considered how, like, wondered how shared libraries work? Mm-hmm. So there, there are symbol names, and how are they actually resolved? What happens at runtime? Why, why things happen the way they do? Or like, why do you sometimes need to have the same static library multiple times on the link line on some compilers, but not others? Or otherwise, your thing fails. And, and these are the sorts of things which are explained there. And and this it was like quite difficult things like what should put in the book and what should be on public documentation because like if you if people get the feeling that they're like like I, I've gotten comments from people saying that this is bad because you're paywalling documentation and then like they don't like the fact that it's not all out there for freely available. So it's it's a it's a balancing act on, on, on what to put in the public documentation. Then. So, it's, so the, the idea is that just reading the website documentation is enough that, to, that you can do anything that you want. And then if you want to know more like more detail and, and their sample projects and things and so on, and explains on, on why you would do certain things in a certain way, and that's, that is the sorts of things that are, are mentioned in the book. So it's... it's... Not just, if I may, uh, not just about Mison, but also about um, understanding how build systems work a little bit in general. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So at the moment, it, it kind of seems like CMake has become the de facto standard. Um, do you want to give our listeners a reason why they should be taking Mison uh, seriously right now? Okay. So um, I, I get this question quite often. And, I'm sure you and... do. <laughs> And you could go into lots of detail about like the technical detail of, of like which things are some things done better and so on and, and so on and, and why why string string typing is not a good thing and so on. But I'm not actually gonna do that. Okay. So instead I'm gonna tell you um, like one of the most common comments people give me when I, when they, they meet me at conferences and they tell me that they're using it. And what they tell me is that when you're using Messen to build your software, it feels nice. Okay. That, okay. That's, that's like, yeah, that was kind of the point. It's like you 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 have a task, you need to do it, and it has like, oh, it it did what I expected it to do. So it's it's kind of like, um, so the, so this is the thing which we have spent a lot of time and effort on. Like, how do we get UI and the user experience so that the things that you want and need to do happen almost like automatically, and you and you don't feel like you have to battle against the the tool uh so at work that i had this problem today is that um um if i need to pass they're using cmake and i needed to pass a define that has uh, a string in it so dash d uh, quote oh this backslash quote like and how many levels of quotes do you need to get this to happen and it's like then I, in the event i just gave up and i just wrote the the stringify macro everywhere that I needed it, so that I, I couldn't then need to put in the the quotes in the thing. But um, so in Meson, command lines are not lines; they are always uh, string arrays or arrays of items. And then when you have that, then things are simple because this is a thing. It's like it's a dash d whatever, and you just write it, and the backend takes care of passing it through whatever ever eventual back backend system you might have and does all care of all the quoting because an array of strings is a higher level of abstraction than just plain string. Right. I want to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you word from our sponsor. 
This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by the PVS Studio Company. The company produces the same name PVS Studio Static Code Analyzer that has proved to be great at the search for errors and especially typos. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, C Sharp, and Java code. The article 012 Freddy's Coming for You, which has been recently posted, clearly demonstrates the analyzer's outstanding abilities of searching typos. The article shows how easy it is to make a mistake, even in simple code, and that no one is immune from making it. You can find a link to the article in the podcast description. There's also a link to the PVS Studio download page. When requesting a license, write the hashtag CPPCast and you'll receive a trial license for a full month instead of one week. Do I, any IDEs work well with Mison? I know, uh, you know over the past few years, uh, CMake has gotten a lot of uh, integration, especially from like Visual Studio. Uh, if you're using Mason, is there any IDE integration like that? Uh, so there's some. So the there's um, the Eclipse CDT has it, and then um, but the, the best integration that I'm aware of currently is in KDevelop. Mm. Um, okay. And the, so they they have um, okay. So the thing is that uh, what we have done in, in is that we export all the data that we have about the project and how it's set up uh, with a with a tool, and you can get it as as JSON. So basically, you can you can query a list of all the targets that are going to be there. You get that. all of the compiler flags are, that's going to be used for this particular target. You get that. All of the tests, you get all of that. And then um, if you want to write an IDE plugin, then you don't have to go parsing inside of our, our, our mesh and build definitions. You can just slurp all the data with, with standard JSON thing. And kdevelop was the first... Uh, IDE to, to add full support for that. Um, the originally, um, I, I talked with, with one of the developers of Cube Creator of like how, how this should be exported. Yeah. Be- because there's a, like in IDEs and build system, there's, there's the M times N problem is that you have N, M editors and you have N build systems and then they all need to understand each other and, and it's, it doesn't work particularly well because it's, it's just a lot of code to write and to maintain. So then it was like, okay, let's let's do this in a way that's actually um, so IDE people can use this quite easily. And um, I think th- there are there is a plugin for C Lion made by some guy. I don't know don't know the specifics about that, but but it integrates with C Lion. Um, I had a chat with with the the JetBrains developers at, at CVPCon, I think, uh, and. And like, hey, now you can you can write your your plugin for this, but and then they said, no, no, you write your plugin for us, and <laughs> and and it, to, the discussion went around in circles, and then they're like, no, wait, we don't expose that information yet, so you can't write the plugin. <laughs> no. But uh, but this 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 is like a it's a big issue. It's like when you are uh, like a small player, like well, the tool, how do you get other people to use your thing, and support, and and because. People writing IDEs, they obviously prioritize their work based on their existing uh, users and right. what they want. And it makes sense for them that, that, like, okay, this might not be interesting for us yet, but if it gets popular, then we can add support for that. But it's it's not going to get popular unless people add support for that. So it's, it's a, the, the good old chicken and egg problem. But like um, things are getting better. So the, the, so the KDE develop thing, and, and, and we know now that we can expose all of the information that we have in easy to parse JSON, and then people can use that to to actually write their integration. Previously, it existed, but we hadn't like field tested it. But now we do. So this uh, output file that you're creating is it any kind of standardized thing? I, I swear that there was some discussion several years back about standardizing this kind of interchange between IDEs and compilers and build tools. But maybe I'm so, misremembering something. So the the idea that, that so this was a, came about at the same time as there was the the CMake language server, right? And people wanted to to add that. And then I looked into that, and if I remember correctly, the the CMake build server protocol is very heavily tied into how CMake is set up. So it speaks speaks of it speaks of things in terms of what they are in CMake as opposed to what they are in the abstract. And in, in this case, what we wanted to do is to write uh, uh, basically a JSON specification that could be a standard. So we try to keep everything that's that's like this. So it's it's an abstract 
description not about how Mesen works internally. So um, if there are people who want to standardize these sorts of things, maybe take a look at that and and use that as a basis. And, and if there's any changes that you need for that, someone will be happy to add them because this is a thing which would like be of general use. Right. Because then, then if you want to create a new build system, you just write this JSON intermediary and then you can use all the tools. Okay. So on the this topic of, you know, uh, IDEs and Mison and stuff, it made me think, like, do you... What's the story like if I've got some library that I'm currently building with CMake and I want to build my executable with Mason? Um, how do I like to can do these things tie together? How can I call CMake? I don't know. You know what I'm trying to ask? Yes. So okay. um, this ties into a, a, a larger um, problem of of you have two different build systems and you would. I ideally want to run them at the same time in the same build directory. So you have one uh-huh. call, call the other. And um, this is a thing which people really want, and it seems simple, but it's actually incredibly difficult. Right. And I don't think that it's possible to do reliably in the general case. Now, that being said, uh, we have integration uh, parts for CMake, so, so on different levels. So first of all, what we can do is that if you have a dependency that doesn't provide a package config file, but instead provides just the CMake, um, whatever the module files are. We can uh, use CMake to extract that information and then use that dependency if it's installed on your system. And we can also generate the the CMake file. So if you can build your own thing and install it, then you also generate the CMake modules needed to use it. So, So we have that. And then also in addition, for simple cases, uh, there's there's a thing where you can build a single project with CMake, uh, and it does all the magic and then slurps out the data and links against that. Now, um, I, I, I emphasize again, this works, but it only works for simple cases. Okay. And because uh, where, what happens is that if you have your program and then you have a dependency build with CMake, you go, like, okay, it works. But what, if, what happens if you have, if your dependency that CMake depends on something else which is built with stuff like, say, Mesa, and it's part of your project. You would want to inject your own thing inside the CMake project, so it uses the pre-built, the one that you built. And this is a thing that's not possible. And even if it works, it gets really, really, really complicated. Okay. Um, and so at CVPCon, I had a talk uh, last year um, about uh, this, among others, this issue. And the thing which I mentioned there was that there's actually a really good solution for this problem of like mixing multiple different build systems, which is, uh, well, it's, it's used in Linux, it's called Flatpak. And uh, like a very high level, nutshell version of that is that in Flatpak, you create uh, a file system that looks like a root file system of a Linux distribution. And then you just install things one by one using the, the existing thing because all all projects know how to do that. If you have a CMA project, a Mesa project, or a tools project, that's what they do. They build, they install, and it's usable from the system. Right. And the thing that makes this work is that there's kernel isolation. So when you are inside the, the, the package, you only see what's inside there. And and this for if there are people who care about ABI issues, you could build a completely different ABI inside of this thing. And 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 applications and libraries think they are being installed in the Linux host like usual, but instead they are in this, this special package. And the, the thing that then makes this work is that you can mi- mount your home directory inside of this thing. So you can run it and it and all the dependencies come from the package that it's in, but it, the file system that it sees looks like your home directory. And and it can't tell that all the dependencies come from somewhere else. And And in this way, you build your thing the way you have always built. You just build, install, build, install, build, install. All your dependency it doesn't matter which which uh, build system they're using or whatever. They just work the way they they always have worked. It's kind of nice. the downside is that this is Linux only. You can't really do that on Windows or or Mac. Um, maybe they will add something like this later. I don't know. But but for Linux usage, this is it's really nice. Okay. Okay. Uh- Maybe kind of related to that discussion, how well does Mison work with the currently available C++ package managers like Conan or VC package? 
Um, so it works quite well with Conan. Uh, I had a chat with, with Diego, also at, at CPP Con, and, and what he told me was that he's seeing a lot of increase in usage in Mesa. And, oh, wow. and there's the, all the integration pieces there and it's working. And so Mesa doesn't really care where your dependencies come from. So if you have a package config file that tells you how to use it, that's all it really cares about. Um, and then, um, or, or if you have a, like a CMake dependency and you can use that. Um, now, Mesen also has its own package manager and dependency provider because everyone has to have one of those. And, and the way that works is that you can define a Mesen project as a sub project of your thing. And then you can say, okay, did, um, I want to build this dependency. And the way it's set up on how the system works is that the, the build definition file only finds what dependency you want. It doesn't say where it comes from. And, and like, um, if you look at how Conan works, for example, you have, your, you have to call Conan inside of your CMake lists file. And this, this ties them together. But in Meson, it's like, okay, all of that is somewhere else. Inside of your build definition file, you just tell, this is how my thing is built. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. And then as much as possible, the, the, the extraneous information is fed from the outside. So the, the typical use case that we have is that people build uh, stuff like on Linux, you, you either want or you have to use the system dependencies. But if you are on Windows or on OS X or whatever, then you want to build your own. And in, in Meson, what happens is that you can specify that, okay, I have this dependency, it has this name, and, and then the sub-project is called is, is, is this name. And then what the system does is that, okay, is this dependency available on the system? Yes, okay, I'm going to use that, and then build against that one, and it, like if it's if it's written enough version and all that. And if it's not, then it will build it as a sub-project, and then in in you can specify your own dependency, uh, so it's called declare dependency. So you get a dependency object, which which encapsulates everything that you need to build against this particular dependency. And then uh, it, it might be the dependency object is it's kind of like basically a virtual base class. Mm -hmm. You it just tells you this is how you this is a dependency this is how you would use it and then when you pass it somewhere else then it does all the magic behind the scenes to either build it or or use the existing one. But your build definition file doesn't have to care about this. Okay, I like the approach, the idea that yeah. the external dependencies is just a built-in kind of feature. Yeah, yeah, and then then you get all sorts of things with this. Suppose you have like uh, you like you have a set lib. Usually you have setlib is required by lots of different things, but whenever these, uh, whenever you look up setlib once, uh, then when you call in the sub projects or whatever, whenever someone tries to do a lookup of setlib again, it will always return the same version. There's only one version of any dependency, and it's it's enforced. Mm, that's and, helpful. Yeah, and and for the, the package management system or dependency provider system that we have, it's called wrap. It's like wrapdb dot and and it, it works kind of like Debian, is that you have your upstream source tarball, and then in addition to that, there's a patch file, or it's like a patch zip file, which has just the Meson build files. And then you download both of them, you extract them, and like, it happens behind the scenes. And you extract them, put them overlay on one of the other, and then you can just use that. And this is a way we can provide uh, native build Meson build files for projects which don't build with Meson itself. So like Zlib, and libpng, with JBEG and Lua and, and, and th there's lots of them available. So like when people say that, and it wouldn't be nice if, you, if, if in C++ we had something like Cargo where you just write these things and it downloads and builds everything. Well, we do. And that's <laughs> that's what, what Meson has done for like three years now. So, so the, I, I would I'd like to point out that the, the package, uh, like number of packages we have is not that great, right. um, but submissions are welcome. Jason, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so earlier we all agreed that the more tools, the better. And one thing I've been wondering about is if uh, Mason can uh, produce a compile commands JSON file to send to Kling tooling for uh, all the Kling tools that want that kind of thing for like running Kling tidy. Yes, if I remember correctly, if you had asked me this, this question 201 episodes ago, I would have said yes. Uh, right. It's been there for quite a long time. Like, but, but in addition, what we do is that... Um, in Meson, it's, we have thing called run targets, and it's like it's basically just a command 
and then when you it gives the top level name. So you could have something like Clang Tiny, and then you could just write all the things like needed to run Clang Tiny with your specific setup. Like, okay. but, what we, but what we do is that if you haven't specified a Clang Tidy target yourself, and there is a dot Clang Tidy file in the roots of your project, we will generate a Clang Tidy command for you automatically. Oh. And the same for Clang Format. And, 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 oh, and, and the so, same for Clang Format. That's yes. interesting. Yes. And like, do you do the, the format edit in place, or do you just report if there are things that are mismatched? Uh, it's, it's in place. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is, again, it's like um, the idea is that these are things that pretty much every project is going to have to do anyway. So let's provide them out of the box. And if people right. want to do their own thing, because sometimes they, they need to, if they define their own, then we'll just use that. Well, as long as you're going down that road, do you do the same thing for a doxy file.in or whatever that's called? Um, for for doxygen? Doxygen file in, that's for dox, a, doxygen config files. Yeah, that's what yes. I'm referring to. Sorry. Yeah, so the this just general case general thing for like generating, um, like configuring files with with information like like the config.h file, right? Um, and so that's that's pretty basic. I don't remember if we have specific um, helpers for Doxygen or if it okay. just works with the basic. There, there's a there's a sample project for Doxygen in in the Mesin source repository. If you so you can what, check that out if you, if you want. And I don't okay. know if people are using that. Just that I'd try since you said, you know, it's so magical with Clang Tidy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have magic for everything. <laughs> no, I would not yes. imagine, yeah. Yep. Our, our, our supply of magic is limited, but it gets replenished <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> right. That's good. Uh, I saw that the uh, Misan manual was based on, I think it was version 0 0.53. Uh, do you think you're getting any closer to calling it 1.0? Um, this, it's getting... Um, Closer, closer. Um, this is the the eventual like the horizon problem. It's like, well, we could just add some more. So the right. the original goal that I had, like first ever one point zero limit, was that once DStreamer uses Meson as the only build system, then we okay. We now we know it's 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 good enough. Now okay. we can call it one point zero. Um, but what happened was that then people we got a lot more contribution, a lot more people. Uh, showed up and they, they started submitting stuff and and um, I have a lot of it's it's just keeping up with with the pull requests that I get uh, and and going through all of them is is a lot of work uh, so, so so this hasn't come up but another thing which which has come up now and and um, which I wrote, wrote a blog post about is that um, I've been looking into converting LibreOffice to build with Meson and um, oh. As far as I know, LibreOffice is the largest open source C++ code base in the world. I would not be uh, surprised. Yes. So it's about 8 million lines of code. And if you remove the comments and empty lines, it's about 5 million. And I did some research. And the only thing that I found that was bigger was Chromium. But uh, the Chromium is a monorepo. So they have all the dependencies in the same repository. So it's probably counting it wrong because it was 25 million lines. Right. Uh, and... The way LibreOffice is, is, let's say, interesting in that they, they, they generate a lot of their code. So in addition to this 5 million lines of code that they have, uh, they generate 1 million more from, from IDL files. And, and they do very complicated uh, things where they, they generate code and generate uh, Java bindings and all that sort of thing. And, and there are things which, which you cannot do easily with Meson kernel is you have to do a bit of like some hacks. Um, and this, the, like the, the code generation thing is the thing uh, which is not quite, quite as polished in Meson as, as the other part. So maybe if, if we can manage to make LibreOffice built, so, so currently you can build it on Linux and it, and it even runs, you can start it and so on. Um, but you would also need to make it run on Windows and, and Mac and Android and, and all the other things. And, and they need um, special things. But I would imagine that if we can pull that out, then there's really no point in delaying the 1.0 anymore because it's it's if you can do that, then you can do pretty much anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I so I just had to check because I know the Star Office, or excuse me, Libra Office, which is based on Open Office, which is based on Star Office, has a very old code base. Uh, and so it's uh, apparently 1985 was when that project was started. So I'm not at all surprised, as you said, their build system is interesting. Yes, and then they, like the entire code base is also interesting because it was uh, owned by Sun, and I I think what happened is that John uh, Sun used it as a like a poster child for Java, and and if you look at the code and the, the way things are set up and so on, it's very Java like, um, mm. and and it's like com colon colon star. A sun colon colon star colon colon office colon colon and like it just goes on forever, um, and and so on and it's, um, perhaps not all of the uh, like technical decisions made at the time have stood the test of time. So, so it's it's interesting in many ways. I'm sure it is. <laughs> how how far along are you in this uh, project to try to get LibreOffice to build with Mason? Uh, so for Linux, as, it, as I said, you can you can compile it and it okay. starts. Um, what I had to do is that I had to take all the data files from an existing uh, build. I just like, installed my binaries over that. Uh, so that's that's roughly where it's at. So it's like the first ninety percent is done, and then it has the second ninety percent, and the third ninety percent, and <laughs> and, and so on. Um, again, so like just getting stuff running is is not that much because the policy is where things actually matter. And then there are some corners which have been cut, like there's no Java support at the moment. And and, and so it gets very interesting because some of the unit testing that they do on C++ code is written in Java for some reason. Okay. So you, so you need to have that. And, and yeah, it's a big project. And just to uh, remind everyone, you it sounds like you are still working a full-time job while also trying to build this tool. Yes. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yes, but the, there's a saying in Finland which goes that goes like the following: uh, bachelors have time for hobbies. <laughs> okay. So, so there you go. And now, now it's the the COVID nineteen. So I'm going to be stuck here inside four walls anyway. So we expect that 1.0 release within the next <laughs> few weeks. Then that's how yeah, I, I just heard. Yeah. Yeah. So a few days. <laughs> two two months self quarantine. Get it done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, don't go crazy. Just for the record, since we did just bring it up again, there is an outside with sunshine that you can go to without interacting with other humans. Yes. So th this is Finland. There's no sunshine. Uh, well, maybe in a couple weeks there'll be some sun coming up in Finland. Yes. Yeah, um, hopefully. We have our, our last sunny day before we get another bout of snow actually coming up tomorrow. Um, but that's Colorado. Yeah. Okay, well, is there anything else you want to go over before we let you go, UC? Okay, so um, if we go back back a bit, and I was still like, the question is like, why, if, if CMake is the standard, why, why, mm -hmm. why should people change that? Right. Well, I'm thinking about this. There, there's actually a word for this because, like, replacing an existing standard with a different one, this, it's called progress. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. It's like, if we never do that, they would still live in caves, and and yeah. and all compilation would be done by carrying boxes of, of punch cards from one place to another, and the, this is the this is how progress works: is that you have a standard, but then you replace it with something better. Hopefully, I, I did have one question about that. Um, you know, you talked about some of the projects that are using Mison now. Um, did most of them come from like kind of older build tools or custom build tools, like things like just make scripts or autoconf, or did you have any projects that you're aware of that came from CMake and, and are now using Mason and are happier with it? So, so most of the projects that I know of have come from, uh, like autoconf and, yeah. and possibly handwritten make files. That's, that's the bulk. Uh, but there are several projects that I know of that, that have come from CMake and, and, Based on, on the comments that I've heard, they've been pretty happy with it. That's good. Cool. Okay. Well, it was great having you on the show again today, UC. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. See you in another 201 episodes or so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. right. Episode 440. All right. <laughs> All right. Enjoy. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. 
You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like CppCast on Facebook and follow CppCast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left to Kiss on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.